Thank you, John. I'm really excited to have Dr. K and Edwin in the building with us. My initial introduction to both of them was at the Black August Film Festival, watching their film. Dennis, a strong community partner at the Black Pages, reached out and he said, yo, you got to check these people out. This film is amazing. It's incredible. Everything he said is the truth. I was very impressed, but beyond just the film, the work and the dedication, what they're doing in the community is incredible and all over the world. And so they're coming Coming to us live from New York. So this is a late night for them. I hope some of you had a chance to engage with the website and see a trailer of the film yourself. And then if you haven't, um, we will have some, I believe they have some that they can show you right now. And if you did, I know you have some questions ready. So we're just excited. Let me uh, share a little bit about Dr. K. So, uh, Dr. K is a powerful and brilliant filmmaker, um, and she is bringing, raising awareness about the global issue of Black children being pushed out of the educational system. She is a visionary who can make magic and transform any space she's in. Dr. K leads with compassionate courage and has bridged her love of supporting individuals with special needs and individuals impacted by the criminal justice system with storytelling in film. Growing up in the Bronx and becoming a special ed teacher in the Bronx, seeing kids drop out of school was the norm. Dr. K founded Preschool to Prison LLC and is the film director of her new documentary, Preschool to Prison. She has served on the International Board of Directors and the Education Legislative Committee at ASCD, where she advocated to Congress and developed national education policy points to address systemic barriers. She is also a co-author of the new classroom instruction that works. So with that said, I'm passing the mic on to Dr. K. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And it's exciting to be here as I'm reading the chat of all the different people that are here this evening. So welcome everyone. The fact that you're here already tells me that you're a certain person who really cares about education, whether you have a child of the system or not. I always say that everybody should care and want to be part of this process and the reforming of education. We have a lot that's happening in education. And just to give you a little bit of background of how this doc came to be, because that's the number one question that we get asked the most is like, what made you decide to do a documentary on the school to prison pipeline? And why did I name it preschool to prison? Because you often hear about school to prison pipeline, but we don't talk about preschool to prison. I was a special ed teacher and I actually started to notice an overwhelming amount of black and brown boys mainly being referred for special education. And I would sit there and I'm like, there's nothing wrong. Why? What does the IEP say? And I'm saying, this kid could do this. This kid could do that. There were more things these kids could do. And, and it was just left, it left me wondering why, right? And so as I continued to dig, and I'll tell you, it was so bad. I remember a student in particular named Suleiman who migrated to the US from Africa and I, that year I was teaching second grade that year, but this child was brilliant. All of these babies were brilliant. And I remember saying at the time back then, one of the classifications, they called it mental retardation. They changed the name and they now refer to it as intellectual disability. And his IEP said uh, mental retardation. And I was like, absolutely not. And so I started digging through the paperwork, through the history of when he was first referred for special education. Now, first of all, let me clarify. Many people don't understand special education is not a place. It has been used as a place. Special education is actually a set of services that children receive to address any type of uh, needs that they have that require additional supports. And sometimes that means they need to be pulled out into a separate setting. It is not designed, it is not supposed to be designed as a place, although we use it as a place. Hence why many parents don't want that stigma attached to their child. Okay. The other part is a child should not be receiving special education for their entire schooling life. 
and we have kids that are receiving services, once they get in, it's hard for them to get out, which is not the goal. The goal is to actually decertify children from receiving the services. It's no different than if you injured yourself, you went to physical therapy, you shouldn't have to go for the rest of your life. It should just be for a temporary amount of time. So with this child in particular, when I went back and read the notes, the psychologist actually wrote that he wouldn't answer her questions. And because he didn't answer her questions, she labeled him as mentally retarded. The child was five at the time and migrated to this country, so didn't fully speak English. You are asking him all these weird questions. And so the parents never questioned it because they're new to the country and they're just trusting that the, why would the education system say something like this? That's not true. And so I started the process of decertification and I helped parents to understand what their rights were. And I said, you have every right to challenge this. As his teacher, I will also challenge it, reopen the case. Of course, you know, many people don't like that. I didn't care. I was like, this is a child's life. And he was decertified, absolutely nothing wrong. And there were many more kids like that. And so as I started uncovering, that's how I discovered the school to prison pipeline. And I actually had never heard of it when I first came into education. And I was just disturbed about what I read and, and what I was hearing about. And at the root of all of this is policy. And at the root of policy is mindsets. What are the mindsets that we hold about children, about people with special needs, about immigrants, about children whose first language is not English? Uh, you, you know, children of color, what mindsets do we hold? And when we look at all of those policies that are in place, it comes back to the mindsets that people hold about children of color, about girls, about immigrants, anything that you want to attach to that. And that's actually when I started my journey of leaving the classroom and uncovering more policy and realizing that my work was really in policy and that I was able to do and have much more impact at that level than I was in my classroom. And so every year I was decertifying kids. I was like, they don't need this. <laughs> you're out, you're out, you're out, you're out. And I mean, it was just, I, I mean, at, at one point, I remember one year my kids actually scored higher than the kids that were in general education. They never belonged there in the first place. Right. So it's it's that kind of stuff and bringing awareness to parents. So that's how the doc came to be. But what more so was the very same system I was working for. My younger brother was actually still in school and, you know, we're 14 years apart. So I'm already in my career working. He's still in school. I'm trying to figure out my own path not realizing that my brother was being groomed for prison and he was the poster child of the school to prison pipeline in New York City and literally went from school to prison. And my brother dropped out of school and they actually didn't notify my parents for six months. For six months, uh, my parents didn't know he wasn't going to school because no one said anything. So he gets up and leaves every morning. Why would you think he's not going to school? You know, and at this point he's in high school. So it's not like he's riding a bus. He's taking public transportation on his own. And by that point, we found out my brother was recruited into a gang. And, you know, we, we all know what happens if you're in a gang. And so through that, my brother actually was sentenced to a prison literally right across the street from his high school. And I was angry, angry because I was working for a system that helped usher him there. While he's responsible for his own behavior, there's still a role that was played in no adult coming to support him at the time and understanding the needs of a 13, 14 year old and not having that support system as to why he left school in the first place. Um, and it it was a prestigious school in New York City as well. It was a school that not many people could get into. So to know that that happened was was very disheartening for us. And through that, my visits to the prison is where I really was like, something has to be done. It's when I saw the amount of adolescents that he was incarcerated with. I mean, they housed them with grown men. So that already was scary for us, right? And I'm like, you have all these children in here with grown men? Um, and that's another issue and story of, of, again, the mindsets, right? Looking at these children as adults when they're not adults and, and realizing that they should not be treated as adults. And so again, right? And then coming back to that is where I said, well, I need to do something where parents understand 
what's really happening in the school system and not unfortunately, not just trusting and believing that every single adult that your child encounters is serving them the greater good, right? Understanding what's actually happening, what are the policies, wh what are the beliefs when you drop your child off, what are the beliefs of this school, of the adults? What are the behaviors and practices? What are the experiences that your child is dealing with every single day? And really listening to those stories. So that, that that's how that came to be. <laughs> So let me pause there for a moment. I said a lot. That's wow. <laughs> wow. I, I'm just, um, I'm blown away when you even talk about special education, not being a place and you describe in there that the services that children are not supposed to have these services the whole way through and the way that they've been utilized and the story that you shared in the beginning just about the young man not knowing English and how he was treated. Just wow. I think that we um, we experience in Pasadena, just like you are uh, in New York, a lot of Black children being placed in special ed for behavioral issues and other things like that. And this is just, it's just so heartening to know that you are there as an instructor, really seeing them and really caring about them and using your own experience in your family to say, hey, let me bring the family in and tell them how to move through this system. Just wow. And I know Renice had some um, questions uh, ready and I'm gonna search through the chat. Please put your questions in the chat right now if you have any questions for Dr. K. And I'm gonna let Renice go ahead. Thanks, Nia. Hi, Dr. K. Thank you so much for being here. We are closely monitoring the chat for any parents who have questions. Um, just go ahead and drop them there. But um, one of our questions um, to you was, how can we create a safe and inclusive environment for courageous conversations about race in schools where diverse perspectives are not only heard, but also respected? And how can those courageous conversations translate into actionable steps and policies aimed at ending educational disparities and promoting greater equity within our schools? Yes, loaded question, but one of my <laughs> favorite questions to be asked. The first thing you, so I, I'm gonna say the word that a lot of people don't wanna hear, which is bias, right? And, and doing the work to check your bias. So I have done several equity audits with uh, different school districts, with corporations because people don't like to hear the word. And especially when someone says, I don't have any bias. I'm like, yes, you do. We all do. We all have bias. And, and here's the issue, right? It's how we use the words that we use as to why people don't like the word. Bias inherently is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, right? It's how you use your bias. And what I share with people is you use bias when you go grocery shopping. You pick one brand over another. That's also bias, right? But it's how you use your bias. And so when people can get over the word bias or feeling that they're being accused of being racist, prejudiced, right? Like these are the things that people get up in arms about, which I understand, right? Like that that's a serious accusation if somebody is, is if that term is used against someone. However, we need to create spaces where we are consistently examining our bias. What do I think of people who don't speak English? I have a thought. What do I think about people who are immigrants? I have a thought. What do I think about people who dress a certain way, who don't come to school with their supplies, but they have on the latest sneakers? We have a thought as educators when we see that, right? We all do. Like we all have a thought about something when we see it. And that's where our bias starts to come in when we create these narratives about our kids and their families. Right? And I, one thing I remember learning was when I first year teacher and had kids coming in with new sneakers, but she didn't have a notebook, not realizing that they got the hand me down or they went to the thrift shop. And one of my students told me that I felt horrible because I had these thoughts in my mind. And I was like, oh man, right? And that was a check for me on not making those assumptions about the realities of what my kids were living through. 
And so it's those kinds of things that we have to talk about that people often don't want to talk about and admit what is the bias. And even if you don't come out to share, but at least admit it to yourself, have that conversation and engage in exercises where people can talk about what is the fear that they have, right? Like, are we building these positive relationships? I cannot begin to tell you how many years I've spent as a consultant teaching educators. And when I say educators, I'm talking about anybody who works for a school district is an educator, whether you're working directly or indirectly with kids, but teaching people in the school how to build relationships with kids. And I was like, you struggle with building a relationship with an eight-year-old, right? <laughs> like, I've seen educators be scared of kids. I'm like, she's seven. Why are you scared of this child? But at the root of that, we fear what we don't know. And you're only fearing that child because you don't have a positive relationship with them. And so we have to get to the place where we, schools should not be a building in the community, right? And so we have to think about how are we truly making the school a community? It's a community school, not a school in a community. And so how do we create that space? We create it by being authentic. We create it by saying, hey, I don't know. This isn't my culture. I'm working here in this district, but I do want to get to know you. I want to learn more about you. Are you doing home visits? What do you really know about your students' home lives, their families? Do you know which families are working two to three jobs? Do you know the culture of what they're coming from and what they value? So it's it's bridging that disconnect of understanding the culture of like, what do these families value? I've had kids come to school for the first time at nine, nine. And when I would dig and ask why in their culture, you go work on the farm first. You don't go to school. So it's not that the families don't care about their children or their education, but again, right, different cultural values. So it's having those conversations and understanding, well, what is your belief about school? What is your belief on, about discipline? What is your belief about this? And how do we now bridge that together and so that the school can be truly seen as an access of resource and a place where children can feel liberated to freedom dream, to think the way they want to think, to be as creative as they want to be creative, where people are not stifling and pushing their mindsets and beliefs on children, but allowing them to just be. And we have a long way to go, but we can definitely get there. No, thank you for that. I, um, I'm going to ask another kind of follow-up question to that. Um, so when we talk about examining biases, right, oftentimes as educators, when we do this institutional push for examining biases, there's so much pushback, right? Because as you said, people feel accused and and um, like we there's something wrong <laughs> with all the biases and how they're used, right? So um, in thinking with that, can you suggest some strategies that educators themselves, if we're not doing um, departmental um, development, I guess, around biases, what other um, effectively address deep-rooted um, issues surrounding disproportionate suspension of Black children, especially from this pre-K to fifth grade, and how can these strategies contribute to dismantling um, the school to pipeline system? So here, if you do an equity audit, at the end of the day, all of this comes back to bias. Mm -hmm. It comes back to the mindsets, again, mindsets, right, that we hold about children. When I'm in spaces where you're suspending three-year-olds, there's something truly wrong when we think that we should just be suspending children just to suspend them. 50,000 preschoolers were suspended. How, like, think about the message, right? And I said this in the film that you're sending to a three-year-old because there's so much data and there's so many studies to support that the first time a child is suspended or expelled from school, you're literally setting them up on a pathway 
to go from school to prison because they're likely to encounter suspension again or expulsion again. You're literally creating a space and you're communicating to them, you don't belong here. And what you do is you create a space where they do not feel a sense of belonging. And there's not a single human on this earth who does not want to feel like they belong. So a child cannot, right? When you look at neuroscience, the human brain is not developed until 25. Now, it doesn't mean that we excuse misbehavior, right? But we have to understand that a child, you cannot rationalize with children. And so the biggest thing that I, I work with educators on is you're here to teach discipline, not administer it, All right? There's a difference in that when we come with a mindset to discipline people's children versus I'm teaching discipline. A child does not understand or comprehend suspension at three years old, four years old. Right. And so until we do that, and I can't begin to tell you how many kids have been suspended. They know they did something wrong, but they don't understand the why. No one ever explains the why. They just tell them, you can't do this. You're out of here for 10 days. 10 days. <laughs> so then now they fall behind academically. So this is why it plays into why our reading scores are low. Reading scores are low in this country. Suspension is high. There is a correlation, not necessarily causation, but there's a correlation there between why we have so many kids leaving school who cannot read. And we have to think about the long-term effect on society if we are pumping out so many children who cannot read, so many children that do not feel a sense of belonging. More now than ever, suicide rate is so high amongst our youth because they feel so pressured and they do not feel a sense of belonging. And so we have to move from this place of punishment to building positive relationships and creating psychologically safe places and spaces for kids so that when they show up, they know number one, I am safe here. I am gonna be treated with respect. I feel a sense of belonging and everybody here cares for me. Wow. Yeah. Um, Courtney just put in the chat, teach discipline, not administer it. That's a bar. I have to agree. <laughs> I have to agree. I wanted to get a question from, from the chat. Thank you, Esperanza, for your question. She said she brought up the language around cell phone usage policies, mm -hmm. and it desensitizes youth to, youth to behavior and consequences that criminalize them. First offense, cell phone jail. What are some national strategies to push back at the district level? And this is something she said she raised last year in her science class with her sixth grader. Um, and the teacher just, you know, said a well-intentioned young teacher just dismissed the whole thing. But um, she's looking for maybe some strategies that, that we can advocate or, or use push back. So my question to Esperanza, is this a teacher's rule? Is this a school rule? Is this a district rule? Because um, uh -huh. Go ahead. Sorry, Dr. K. Hi. Um, so I know uh, my kids are at, my son's at Blair a Middle School. And so it was only at back to school night when they read like the rules. Some, some teachers don't use that language, mm -hmm. um, but but some teachers use first offense, second offense, confiscation, like just terrible. These are like babies. They're 11 and 12. And so um, so that's a really good question. I'm not sure if it's like a, I know there's a, pol there, like it's a policy like for secondary because cell phone usage is so big, but like it's the languaging, right? That I'm like, you're teaching kids that they're criminals um, and that the consequences are just, they're, they don't seem to like match, right? And so um, I know there's cell phone usage policies district-wide, but it's like, it, are there, is it part of the national conversation in the preschool to prison pipeline movement in trying to, to end that, interrupt it around 
this because again, my sixth grader was like, don't say anything, mom. And then the teachers were like, meh, you know, kids. I'm like, no, it's terrible. No cell phone jail, no jail at all. Right. What? Right. The right. The language, the language. So the reason I asked, I wasn't sure if it was a teacher who gone rogue and created their own rule, because at this point you talking to the teacher isn't going to change anything. It's going to the district because that's where the policy stems from. And the board meeting is where you want to raise these issues. You want to show up to the board meeting and address this. And I know every district is different where you have to sometimes put your name on a list to be on the next round for the board meeting. You know, there are different things you can do, but I would also even talk to other parents about it because it's, I understand why they wouldn't want kids to have cell phones in school. I completely understand. It's the approach that's the issue. And so that's what you want to clarify with them that you don't have a problem with them saying no cell phone use during school. It's the language that's being used. And what's it, what's the impact on how a child is internalizing? 11 and 12, year old, my phone is the most important thing to me at 11 and 12. My relationship with my friends is the most important thing to me at 11 and 12. And they don't understand what is developmentally appropriate. That's the piece that I always tell parents and, and working with educators is you want to engage in practices that are developmentally appropriate. So we don't want to start using the language of jail with kids. I mean, for obvious reasons, I shouldn't even have to unpack that. But right? there's just first offense, second offense. But also I say, well, what's going on here, right? That, that you're having to battle with kids so much for their phone, but also what's the address with parents and what is the language and the policy, but also changing that language around, there's no cell phone use, that's it. And so I'm working, I've worked with schools where they uh, have these pouches and every student knows when they come into the building, uh, as some of you, if you've been to like a concert where they say no recording, they have that pouch that you put your phone in and they seal the pouch. Everyone has to put their phone in a pouch. At the end of the day, they unlock the pouch. That's it. You never have to worry about the cell phone again. So there's so many different ways that they can approach, but perhaps come with these solutions for them because they really may not know another way. Sometimes we believe because they are certified uh, you know, people with masters and doctorates that they have the answers and they don't always have the answer. So I would say get together with other parents and talk about it, but also come with other solutions and the impact on the adolescent development and the strain on the relationship between the adult and the child. And it, it creates a situation for the teachers where now I have to battle all day long for these cell phones so I can teach a lesson. Right. And so you don't really get anywhere with that approach. But I would definitely, that that is definitely a step where they collect the phones in the beginning. I've even been in schools where maybe even if they don't collect it in the pouch, in every classroom, there's a bucket. Every kid drops it in the bucket up front. That's it. They all know that that is the, the um, what the protocol is. They get the phone at the end of class. No one has the phone. They turn it off. It's in the bucket. Right. So there are different ways that they can definitely approach this. But I'm, I agree with you a thousand percent using the terms of first offense and you know then we start saying repeat offender i've heard the it's like we these terms are just not appropriate to use towards kids because when you start hearing these terms over and over you start internalizing that about yourself that's what's happening right it starts to become self-fulfilling prophecy and that's not the kind of language that we want to put upon children great question esperanza thank you yes um, Nia, I just wanted to jump in really quick because I know we, we're almost at our time. Um, we couldn't show the trailer. We wanted to, my name is Edwin also. I'm a producer of Preschool to Prison with the amazing Dr. K. And I also went to Woodrow Wilson Middle School in 99 and 2000. And my grandfather was a teacher at Blair and at Elliott. So I'm a former Pasadena um, student and my experience at Pasadena Unified School District was one of one because I went from Chicago, Oakland and Pasadena and it was at the time when a lot of Latinos were coming into the district so it it molded me and who I am today and why I care about social justice but we I mean um we we did this project out of having these conversations so I wanted to direct everybody to preschool to prison documentary after the phone call, after the Zoom call, 
and you can contact us. Dr. K is an amazing mindset coach, professional development coach, and we just really want to end the educational lynch and that's been going on. So we're just so thankful for the work that you guys are doing in the community because we know that it's definitely, definitely needed. Thank you so much. And thank you for, yes, we got to talk more about all of that, all your, your Pasadena experience <laughs> and share and, and everything and who your grandpa is. Cause I, you know, I don't know. I might know him. <laughs> it's a small town. Now, thank you so much. This, this is everything and we will definitely be in touch. And if anyone has additional questions, keep putting them in the chat and then we'll share all those questions with you guys. So thank you so much and have, have a great night. I'm going to pass, pass it over back to Jeff. Thank all right, thank you. Um, yeah, much appreciation. Thank you all. Great questions. Collect all your questions and continue the good fight. All right. Thank you so much, Natasha. I appreciate it. Um, so this 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 is a kind of a mini PowerPoint I'm gonna run through real quick uh about the campaign that we led is in the district APC. Uh to, to it, the intention was to reduce black disproportionality and suspensions in Pasadena. Um not sure that we got there and we'll talk about that, but we did have some major wins and some major influences. So we will get to that uh, in a second, but I wanna just talk a little bit about school discipline and PUSD. You've heard about it from a national level, from a New York City level, uh, from Dr. K, but let's talk about it from Pasadena. So pre-pandemic, black students in PUSD were 10 times more likely to be suspended than Asian students, five times more likely than white students and twice as likely as Latino students, Latinx students to be suspended um, in, in, in PUSD. Um, when you look at uh, some research that came out of UCLA, uh, the Center for the Transformation of Schools is actually run by Tyrone Howard, for those of you that know uh, Dr. Howard. Um, PUSD is identified, was identified uh, at that point as second in LA County in terms of black suspensions. Only Antelope Valley um, was worse in terms of, 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 of the suspension rate of black students in the district. Uh, and it was actually double the overall suspension rate for black students in LA County. Can you click it one more time? So the district, you know, uh, earlier in the previous decade did some work around willful defiance and saw some pretty major drops in suspensions overall. But if you see that black line up top, that's, I mean, the black line up top, the red line up top, um, that's, that's black students, right? And so you'll still see that even though black students have, you know, all suspensions have gone down over time, there is a marked difference between um, black students and, and students from other racial categories in our district. Uh, and Dr. K said, she talked about her, her own brother, right? That, that suspensions lead to disproportionate outcomes in school and life, right? That suspensions contribute significantly to, like she said, once a student has been, has been suspended once, a student's often suspended twice, three times. Um, we know that young people who aren't in school lose instructional time. And, I, and I, we, know that, we know that instructional time is important given how much time students lost with the pandemic. Right? Uh, they fall behind in coursework, uh, it leads to dropout rates, and then leads to what, you know, what is known as the school to prison pipeline. So we, you know, at AAPC, we're, we're really about building black parent power. Right. And this is this is a, a core a core belief for us. We believe that students, um, our students really need us to have their back. And that as parents, we have way more power than we've ever imagined, especially when we come together and push, push together. I think I think for many of us um, in this space, you know, the summer of 2020 was a real pivot, right? We were all home during the pandemic. Watching, t watching, you know, watching on the TV and reading in the news, and 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 really, I think the Black Lives Matter movement was really kind of at full at full force, and really making us think about um, the types of the type of world that we could see coming out of the pandemic, and that included our district at APC. Uh, so shout out to Michelle Bailey, who, who was, was in the room, hopefully still in the room. Uh, she authored a, a really pivotal resolution, uh, to, res Resolution 2566, uh, Capacity to Unified School District's Commitment to Black Students um, and Black Families. Right? Uh, can you click it two more times? Thank you so much. 
And in her resolution, which was unanimously approved by board members um, that, that were serving at that time, they talked about, you know, we talked about the things that we kind of already know, right? That black students continue to be disproportionately overrepresented in disciplinary practices, special education, as Dr. K talked about, and underrepresented in all the types of things that you want for kids, right? Uh, advanced placement, honored, gifted and talented programs. And the board promised, right? They, they, they resolved themselves. Uh, themselves to be committed uh, committed to eradicating practices, policies, and systems um, that had a discriminatory, racist, or suppressive impact on Black students. So for us, I mean, suspensions were were, were, were just that. Not only were they called out in two five six six, but when we look at the the data, it's it's um, I mean, it's spot on. I mean, it's it's undeniable. Two more clicks. Thanks so much. So we, you know, we're not organizers, right? We're, we're, we're parents with full-time jobs and many of us have partners and, and we have kids and we're busy, right? But, but not too busy um, to get organized ourselves and to push, right? So we worked with uh, a, an organizer at One LA and developed an organizing strategy. And it was three parts, right? Which we met with our district and school administration. We worked in meetings like this to build critical awareness of parents in our district. And then we leveraged community support. And so we'll talk about those two right now. Um, so we met with school and district administrators. Many of them are on the call right now. Um, and, and shout out to them for, 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 you know, for taking the call and, and, taking, the, and, and taking this up and, and not wanting to be adversaries with us, but really wanting to, to listen and to, to see this through. And so um, you know, our former superintendent, uh, Dr. Rotano, uh, helped us to put together a task force that was led by Patrice Marshall McKenzie, who's an amazing board member in our district now. Um, and we, we got to work. Um, but can you click one more time? Thanks so much. That star is everything. <laughs> but um, we, we, we had the opportunity, again, we, we think this is really, it's critically important that we have Dr. K's in our life. It's critically important um, that we have folks like Chris Chapman, that we have folks like Travis Bristol to really think about, think deeply about issues that impact students and families, specifically Black students and families. So I put the star next to Luke Wood because he is now the president of uh, Cal State Sacramento, Sac State. Uh, and he spoke to us last year. And he really told, he really charged us with thinking thinking differently and reimagining school discipline, especially uh, as it landed for TK to, to five students. Thank you. Shout out to Queen. He, he does do good work for sure. And we leverage community. And so the folks who are in the building, the Yolans, the Lisas, the Mo Hymans, um, you know, uh, uh, folks from, you know, uh, Susan from Penn, uh, Eric Johnson from Stars, uh, Mary Donnelly from, from Young and Healthy, uh, Christy Zamani from Day One. So many folks, um, you know, led their, led the, helped us lead the charge, right? And show that they were, they were behind us. They wanted to stand on the side of justice. They knew that, that, that what we were pushing for was not anti-district, right? We love, we, we, we love Pasadena, right? Um, and, and we want these schools to be great, but we want them to be psychologically safe, like Dr. King talked about. And so do these organizations. So they got behind us to do this work. Uh, so we launched we launched the task force led by Patrice. Shout out to Patrice. She is amazing, a leader uh, and board member. Um, and we really turned our focus to the youngest learners. Uh, and and let's see what let's see what we did. <laughs> we got a win. Oh, can we go back one more time? I think I might have messed it up. So we, we got our win, right? Um, we 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 actually got policy changed, right? And and in the policy change, we reduced suspendable offenses. For students in TK through five, we're thinking about kids, you know, TK. I mean, that's what are you four years old, right? Um, and so suspensions can now be only two days at, at maximum. There's a restorative meeting during the return for suspension, and I really want to shout out Dr. Julie Reynoso, who leads um, the student wellness work in the district, and we we're able to get wellness teachers in all of our elementary schools. And actually, this year, I know Dr. Torres is on this call too. There are wellness teachers in every elementary school every secondary school and every high school, right? These folks are creating psychologically safe school climates, right? And this really started about a meeting with district folks and some parents, all right? I'm telling you, parent power is undefeated. Let's talk about this impact one more time. So look at this, look at this impact on suspension. And, the, and I'll, I'll give you two more clicks. 
Thanks so much. So the first two bars on the top are pre-pandemic, right? 2017, 18, 2018, 19. It's kind of our first, our last two major years um, uh, that we have suspension data from. And so you see the total suspensions in the light blue and black student suspensions in the dark blue, right? Um, so you see total suspensions were like 277 down to 244. And this data right here is not full year data. I think this is the last, we got, we got it through from September through March, March of 2023. And we were down to 50 suspensions total in the district TK through five, from 277 to 244 to 50. All right. Um, and for us, that's a reduction. I mean, the math on that is a reduction of like 70 percent, oh, between 60 and 70 percent. Right. Those are reductions that you just don't see. You don't see that. Right. And again, I just want to remind us that that was led by parents. Right. Parents were at the table pushing for this, pushing for a task force pushing for resource allocation, pushing for policy change, and we got it. So let's click one more. What we didn't get was a change in disproportionality, right? So we went into this really thinking, how do we impact, how do we, how do we shift school discipline for black students, right? Um, I'm not sure we got that, right? We, we're definitely suspending less black students, but the disproportionality when black students make up 10% of the population or close to 40% of the suspensions, even after we introduce this policy, we're not there yet. We're, we're as Kobe would say, job's not done. Can we click one more? So um, before I pivot, I just want to talk about some of our lessons learned, right? I think one, we don't have to be adversarial, right? We're talking about some real talk in this meeting today. We talk about real talk in all the meetings that we have, right? But we talk about this because we love Pasadena and we love Pasadena Unified, right? This is where so many people on this call went to school, where we, where we raise our kids, right? And, and we, we want to create schools that are amazing for all students, right? Including our students, our, our students' friends, kids down the street, and the kids we'll never meet, right? Um, so we know that we, we, we can partner and work together and create meaningful wins for black students and black families, right? The second thing is when you focus on issues that, that are meaningful and impactful for black students and black families, it actually lifts all boats, right? All students get better. All families get supported when you focus on black, on, on black students because they're on the margins, right? And when you do for folks that are on the margins, everyone, everyone, everyone um, improves, right? Um, the third piece is that parent power for me, for us, is, is transformational, right? Uh, and we know that Black parents are going to need to lead the reimagine, reimagination work of schooling around for Black students, right? We need to be there at the table and leading the charge. And so we hope that, that parents that are on this call, Black parents, parents of Black students, and, and parent allies, we hope that we can, you'll, you'll continue to walk this work with us uh, together. Um, but the last piece is that you can change policy, you can change practices, and you can change resources. That doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to eliminate racism and you're going to reduce disproportionality, right? And so I want to end that there. Um, so, so I'm really excited to have, uh, I, hope I, I hope I don't mess his name up again, Jason. Uh, Dr. Jason Okanofua. Uh, he's a social psychologist in the psychology department at UC, at UC Berkeley. Uh, and Jason's research program examines social psychological processes that contribute to inequality in contexts such as education, criminal justice, and business. His research investigates how negative stereotypes can contribute to disparities in life outcomes and how that process can be dismantled, especially in educational contexts. Uh, his research has been published in top journals and has been featured on a variety of popular media, including MSNBC, Reuters, Huffington Post, and Edweek. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Okanofua uh, to the AAPC. Hi, uh, thanks, John. And, uh, thank you all for having me tonight. I have a, uh, a little kindergartner, five-year-old, uh, who I've seduced with a movie, um, but I'm gonna have to leave soon because I don't know how long it's gonna last. But I do, uh, uh, I am happy to be here. Uh, it was through John knowing someone from my team uh, that uh, got me here. I work with school districts throughout the country. And what I'm gonna show you today is the, I'm gonna, I have 15 minutes, so I'm gonna go quickly and cover a lot, but I'll be happy to come back and explain a number of these things more. Um, 
for example, what I'm going to touch on is like an entire course that I teach for the grad students up here at Berkeley, but just the science of bias, because a lot of times it's not understood exactly what bias is or how it functions or how to talk about it or how to address it. Instead, we tend to just lean on things like we just need to raise awareness. Uh, and unfortunately, that doesn't things aren't as intuitive as we would hope for them to be. Um, and so I'll just jump right in here. Let me see if I can share the right screen. Okay. Um, right. And so, yeah, just going to jump in and be quick for the sake of time. Um, so uh, contrary to popular belief, bias is actually a normal thing. It's how we function as human beings. Uh, the issue is that it may not always be desirable. And at this point, it's very certain types of bias uh, that have become taboo. And so bias is actually basic to the evolution of humans. It's how we categorize things. Uh, it's how we uh, have survived and been able to determine if something was safe or bad. If we associate red with bad, that type of categorization allowed us to not eat poison berries uh, way back in the hunter-gatherer days. It's very functional. Um, however, it's when it's specifically the, the stereotypes that uh, in the same way as how we need to categorize a immense amount of information in small amounts of time, the thing with the stereotypes is that it definitely for sure leads to errors. Uh, and those errors can be life-changing. So an important thing to know that I don't think the academy has disseminated to the masses is just where does bias come from? And I think if we understand this, we'll better understand just what it is that we're up against in these uh, uh, pivotal settings. Um, and so an experiment was done in 2008, published in Science Magazine, which is our top uh, peer reviewed scientific journal across all of the sciences. Um, and so just to let you know, it's very rigorous work. They took the first few seconds of the most popular TV shows out at the time. That was like Grey's Anatomy, Scrubs, Friday Night Lights. I don't keep up with them, but all the different law and order letters, um, those shows that a lot of people watch, they took the first few seconds of it in which there was a conversation between two people or an interaction between two people, namely a white person and a black person. And so it's only gonna be a clip that's like one or two, uh, two or three seconds long. And they remove the audio such that viewing this clip, all that you're seeing or being exposed to are the characters' nonverbal behaviors and for a very brief amount of time. And after they showed this to a lot of participants, they had them take this thing called the IAT, the Implicit Attitudes Test, which is a way, to, it's not a great measure, but a measure to determine people's implicit bias. And in this case, they were looking at anti-Black or pro-White implicit bias. And what they found was just by watching that brief clip with no audio, that significantly increased people's anti-Black or pro-White implicit bias. And so if we take a step back from that, that means when we're just walking through the airport and there's TVs on and we don't even hear what's going on on the TV, or when we're walking through the grocery store or walking down the street, sitting in a restaurant, just seeing how Black people are treated in this society, that actually gives us more of the anti-Black implicit bias. Um, and so I just want us to keep that in mind to make sure that we understand just what it is that we're up to and that it, it won't be simple. It won't be straightforward to go up against something like that. Uh, and so they've actually been doing a lot more work recently to take a look at just, well, how well are we doing? Um, and so in one meta-analysis that came out, it was during the pandemic 2021, uh, from some researchers on the East Coast, they did this thing called a meta-analysis, which is where they took all of the experiments that have been done attempting to reduce people's prejudice. I think it was 418 experiments, and they put them all together and look at it statistically to see, um, overall, is this working? And what they found was that the results were very mixed, uh, and at best, if it did work, the effect was weak, um, and it didn't last long. So to better explain that, I just want to briefly touch on this uh, uh, other paper. They did an intervention tournament, as they called it, but basically they tried the most popular uh, and most theory-driven approaches to try to get rid of anti-Black 
implicit bias, implicit and explicit bias. Um, and so for the sake of time, not definitely not gonna go through all these, but just so you can get an idea of like just how thorough and extensive these are, but then how also a lot of these things are the things you see in popular DEI trainings or implicit bias trainings or anti-racism trainings that we see today. Things like, um, well, I won't go through them for the sake of time, but I'll be happy to discuss more later. The takeaway here is that uh, uh, in science, we can determine if something was effective or not based on this score that's on this graph. And what's accepted as a minimal or weak effect is a 0.3 on this, on this chart, which is uh, uh, noted with the red dotted line. And just don't worry about all the dots, don't worry about all the numbers. The only point is, is that most of those dots, circles, and lines are to the left of that red line, meaning that most of these approaches were not effective at all at reducing people's anti-Black implicit bias. And then when you look at the ones at the top, the few that were to the right of that red line that were somewhat effective, they were very weak. They were right there at the bare minimum. And they ran follow-up studies uh, with those same participants and found that even for those ones that were had that weak effect, the effect went away within five minutes or 24 hours. And I hope that makes sense based on what I described to you about the other research, because as soon as these participants or whoever it is left that training or left that experiment room, they just go right back into society where they're getting that they're getting inundated with all of these uh, negative stereotypic messages uh, that then brings the biases back. And so didn't come here tonight to just give you all a dark story of what we're facing, but I, it's important that I communicated the science where we are and what we know so that we know what we're up against. And fortunately, my team and I, we have discovered the only science-based means to do something about it. And put simply, what we, what my colleagues are telling me to stop being so humble. What I put together um, is this thing called sidelining bias is what I call it, uh, that I'll come back to. But essentially, instead of focusing on trying to de-bias people or just turn people not racist or sexist or other types of biases, the objective would be to create situations where bias is rendered not functional that if someone is biased, they'll get in the way of them reaching their own goals, which I'm gonna be coming back to. Um, and so just quickly uh, to tell us more about the lay of the land, which you're, what it looked like y'all were seeing in Pasadena, it is what we've been seeing throughout the United States, explosion and exclusionary discipline, like suspensions, expulsions, school referral, I mean, yeah, school referrals to law enforcement. And that's, there's the disproportionality such that Black children at that time in 2012 were six times more likely to be suspended than their peers. Uh, however, likely, and yeah, what, what I just saw in the slides that John was presenting, um, in a number of ways, overall discipline rates have started to go down, and yet the disproportionality remains. And so just to make it clear that it's not specific to Pasadena. It's, and I'm working in Florida and Pennsylvania, all over the place, Chicago, up and down Illinois, it's, they're seeing the same thing, um, which I'm gonna break down. But first, just so that you know, um, information that I, I feel like we should do a better job of getting out. I did research uh, when I was at Stanford, which was the first to show that a student's race does change the way a teacher views their behavior ran an experiment with hundreds of teachers across the United States. At this point, it's at the thousands of teachers and found the same results. We had had them imagine themselves as a teacher at the school and had them read information uh, uh, about a misbehavior that occurred. The misbehavior is taken word for word from office referral records I got from uh, Rayma Reynolds, who was on that slide earlier. Um, so they're taken from Southern California office referrals. Um, and that this, this is indeed one of them. This is what was classified as insubordination. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, classroom disruption, uh, which is the second leading reason for children to be suspended throughout the country or referred to the office throughout the country. The number one one being that thing that we call insubordination or willful defiance or disrespect. Um, but the commonality between that and classroom disruption is that it's subjective. What I mean by subjective is that if I ask the people in this, if I ask 10 people in this meeting, what does disrespect look like? We might get eight different answers because it's open to interpretation. And what we know about bias is that when it's ambiguous and it's subjective, 
that's when stereotypes fill in information and guide the way we respond or, or think about things. And so teachers read this and unbeknownst to them, they either read about a student named Greg or Jake, or they read about a student named Darnell or Deshaun. And so through previous research, we know those are stereotypically white and stereotypically black names. Um, they read this, they answered some questions about it. And then they were told that same student misbehaves again three days later, they read another one of these and then they answer some questions. I can tell you about all of those things, but I wanna just highlight the key parts about what we can do about it, where the leverage is. And so after that, we asked teachers how severely should the student be disciplined? And after the first infraction, there was no race difference in, in that. However, after the second one, they wanted significantly more severe disciplinary action for the black child as compared to the white child. Again, it's the exact same misbehaviors. Um, and that we see that steep escalation, what we call the black escalation effect, where that, that discipline severity goes zero to 100 real quick uh, when it's a black student relative to a white one. We didn't just find out what, that was the what, what's happening indeed. Uh, uh, race predicts how a teacher will respond to misbehavior, but then we also wanted to ask why. Uh, and I'm not gonna go through all the theory, but essentially we asked teachers the likelihood that they would say that this student is a troublemaker. And they were more likely to say that if the student was black as compared to white. And something to know about the label troublemaker from uh, one of my advisors at Stanford was Carol Dweck. She has work on growth mindsets. Not gonna go too far into that, but just to the extent that this would be a fixed thing. A troublemaker is a troublemaker. A troublemaker in my class is gonna be a troublemaker in the other teacher's class. A troublemaker today is gonna to be a troublemaker tomorrow. Fixed thing, um, which I'm gonna be coming back to. And so they were more likely to think the black child was a troublemaker and they were more likely to think the black child's misbehavior was indicative of an overall pattern. Um, and that we found that actually what's going on is not just that a student's blackness increases the likelihood of them being suspended, is that a student's blackness increases the likelihood that they're seen in that fixed way as a troublemaker. And if any child is viewed as a troublemaker, the response is more severe discipline. And so uh, I don't have a pointer, maybe you can see my mouse, but if all we knew is that race predicted suspensions, all we would be able to do is something about this path right here, which would be debiasing people, stopping them from being racist. However, since we know more about the process, we can actually do stuff here and or here. And these things I'm gonna be showing you, that actually allows us to be much more effective because a lot of implicit bias trainings, like I was showing you, they're not effective, but also they can backfire. People can feel attacked. And when we're talking about teachers who are not in the profession to make money, they're in the profession because they, they wanna do good, it uh, can hurt their morale. And ultimately we end up with not a lot of teachers which we're facing throughout the country. And so by focusing on this path over here, that's what I'm calling a type of approach that's sidelining bias. And so we're not taking on bias straight on, but rather taking on the consequences of, those, of that bias. And so I created some schematics to just walk us through how we can understand this. And then I'll quickly just show you the results that we found in districts throughout the country so far. Um, so if we imagine the status quo, uh, it's basically like I described, there's those sources of bias from all around us, from society that affect us and manifest in uh, explicit and implicit biases in our minds. Uh, and that that plays out at a systemic level or structural level. Uh, and it also plays out at an interpersonal level, how we treat each other, how we think about each other. Uh, in turn, uh, or specifically for black students, that leads them to be more likely to be viewed as a troublemaker, which in turn leads to more severe disciplinary action. And then that puts into place a vicious cycle where they are then at an increased risk of being suspended again. That black escalation effect is exactly what we see in the data if they're suspended once. Actually, I think, yeah, someone said that just a moment. It's real, there's science behind that. Once they're suspended once, it's just a whole pathway all the way through to the school to prison pipeline, unfortunately, a lot of the time. And so, a different approach is targeting policy, which may be uh, what you all uh, have put into place, which is great and necessary. Uh, but what that may look like is that you still have those structural sources of bias. They still feed into the implicit and explicit biases. Those still feed in to the systems and the mindsets. Um, I'll just go through these animations because what happens is that you intervene at that structural level and put a policy in place. 
like throughout the state of California, the ban on suspending students for willful defiance. There's similar things in Florida. You can't suspend a kid for more than 10 days, uh, I believe, unless it's a what they consider a serious offense. These are indeed policies that are put into place for good, that they're done to help. However, what is it seems consistently what is found is that it does effectively reduce suspensions, especially, I mean, I guess we could say, of course it would, if willful defiance was the number one reason for children to be sent to the office for suspensions. If you ban that, then yeah, suspension rates are going to go down. However, what we've found is that the disparities, they remain. Like what the slide I just saw, it's like I've seen a lot of those slides, I've produced a lot of those slides. That seems to be a thing that happens, unfortunately. Um, but then also in interviewing hundreds of teachers at this point, it puts them in a, and administrators, it puts them in a difficult position because misbehaviors still happen. And what do they do about it? Well, up here in Oakland, in work I was doing there, they had a term for it, it was silent suspensions, where it's not counted as a suspension, but a teacher sends that student to another teacher's class, has them go sit in the hallway, or directly calls the student's parents to come pick them up. None of those are technically a suspension or are not written as such, but it is still removing those children from the learning environment, uh, and which is associated with a slew of negative downstream consequences. Um, and so somebody, I saw some nods, it's like those things can seem true, unfortunately, uh, but I will say again, it, targeting policy may not be sufficient on its own, but it is necessary. <laughs> you have to do that part. Um, and ultimately what I'm gonna be saying is it's strategically integrating different approaches is what we find to be effective. And so another approach is like what I was telling you all about when we try to de-bias people, long story short, it's just the exact same process. Because like I said, it has mixed effects and it doesn't last long, hence the dotted green arrow in which it's still ultimately playing out uh, in the same way. The sidelining bias approach that I put together, um, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go too much into it, but basically we made a, series of exercises that teachers can complete online. So we wanted to be scalable from the onset so that all the teachers in an entire city, at this point, multiple cities and multiple states can just do it in their off period, do it during their regular uh, teacher professional development time. Um, and it's laced with a lot of psychological, let's say behavioral economics to communicate certain things. One of them is to slow down and get perspective before a student misbehaves, after a student misbehaves, take the time to find out why. Ask them, don't imagine, don't guess. Ask them what is going on in their life. All of the other things, the situational things that can contribute to misbehavior. If I start naming them, it's gonna become obvious, but it's like we can forget how obvious they are. One of them is puberty. Their hormones are raging out of control. They are just trying to navigate all of that happening in their bodies that can look like misbehavior. They're developing their identities and how to navigate that in the world. And if you're from a stigmatized group, that is a serious undertaking. And so they're managing all of these things. I'll stop there for the sake of time, getting teachers to take more time to perspective take, encouraging them to do so and doing it in a way that it allows teachers to be the champions as opposed to being the people that we point at as the problem, as to blame, which teachers appreciate. Um, we also communicate a growth mindset about students, that if a student misbehaves, they're not a bad kid, they're not a troublemaker, but that's actually an opportunity. The kid's brains are growing. That's a teachable moment. Get in there and do those things that you joined the profession to do in the first place. Um, if not in the tone, I just said it. If you saw the materials, you'll see it's like, no, <laughs> out of respect. You are some of the most empathic people in society. Thank you for what you're doing. Tell us about how indeed it's important and useful to consider that children's brains are growing and that they misbehavior is not an indictment of their character, but rather a situation to be handled. Uh, and then finally, having a growth mindset about the relationship they have with students. And so if there is conflict in a relationship, understanding that that's just the conflict, that's situational, that will change. You can still have a, a good relationship with that student with time uh, and with effort. A lot of this, these approaches I took from work on romantic couples and uh, marriage counseling, and some of these might ring true if you think about what makes the difference between a happy marriage and one that's dissatisfied and that ends. 
It's the extent to which you can fully understand your partner's perspective, the extent to which you understand that things happen, but that's not an indictment of their character and be able to grow with them. That's where this comes from. And I'm just hoping to give you all as much information so that you can make sense of where this presentation is going to end. And so in theory, this then would offset that process and we would have improved discipline outcomes or better yet, no disproportionality in the discipline rates. Um, for a second time, well, I will say this. The approach, what it does and makes it particularly effective is that the it's actually targeting the whole teacher-student relationship, not just the teachers and leading them to not be biased, not just the students and leading them to feel more of a sense of belonging and less of a sense of threat. It's that when a teacher has a more empathic mindset, and this is from a series of experimentation, I'll put the ci citation there, it's top scientific journal if you want to check it out. Um, when teachers have more of an empathic mindset that leads them to respond to misbehavior in a more empathic way, which in turn leads the student to feel more respected in that relationship. And in turn, the student feels more motivated to behave better in the future. And so it's like an in what was otherwise a vicious negative cycle, it then becomes a positive one that strengthens those relationships, makes it uh, a better culture for learning uh, and things of that nature. And so this is the basic setup. Uh, they participate in an online session in the fall, another one in the winter, and that's it, because we, we wanted to make sure that this isn't some thing that's going to make teachers frustrated or defensive or all of those things that lead to the other approaches not working. Okay, I showed you all this to then show you this. We ran this across five school districts here in the Bay Area, and it cut year-long suspension rates by 50%. Um, which is a huge feat given what I just told you. It's two 45 minute sessions. Um, and that these effects, it's not it's lasting five minutes or three days, but rather this is the entire school year. These school districts up here are probably similar to the ones down there, but yeah. It was mostly Latino students and Asian students uh, that were in these schools. And so when we see a 50% reduction in suspensions, it kind of gave us the sense that we're onto something promising, that it's effective for those groups. Um, since that was published by the National Academy of Sciences, the US Department of Education recommended this under the Obama administration, I should say, uh, recommended this as the number one way to combat discipline problems in schools across the country which led a lot of school districts uh, to reach out to me. I chose to work with the largest one, which is uh, in one of the ones in Florida, one of the 10 largest school districts serving about 125,000 students. Um, and so with that one, if you're familiar with Florida, diversity looks different. There are way more black children. And so we could definitively be able to see, did this actually get rid of the disproportionality? And so we ran it across the 17 cities um, with a much larger sample across 20 schools. And I'm sorry, don't mean for this to be some esoteric math class or something. I'm gonna just tell you what to look at here. Um, first of all, looking at the year long suspension rates again, they cut the racial disparities in suspension rates by 45%. So we get a replication, but this time we can definitively say it actually did great work to, that we were specifically interested in, did it in a surgical way, such that it didn't harm any of the white students or the Asian students. However, it definitely benefited the students that were otherwise facing a heightened risk of getting kicked out of school, which is the black and Hispanic students. It's also students who had a history of suspensions. If they had been suspended the previous year, they were more likely to be suspended, but not if they had a teacher that received more of this, this, this empathic uh, mindset uh, through this program. And then finally, as you all likely see in your district as well, there's disproportionality for students that are eligible for special education or students with different abilities. And this completely eradicated that disparity such that they no longer were at any heightened risk of being suspended thereafter. Also in this one, uh, because that large school district was under consent decree by the federal government, they had a lot of motivation to give us everything we needed. And so they gave us their records, not just for that school year, but also the following school year. And so this time, it's not just looking at an effect that lasts an entire school year. What we're looking at now is that by virtue of just having one teacher with more of an empathic mindset, it stuck with the students. They took it with them. Not only were they less likely to get in any trouble throughout the school day, 
they were less likely to get in trouble the following school year when they no longer even had that teacher. Something fundamental changed, which unfortunately says something about the default. By default, our Black children are not feeling empathy at school. If you can have an effect like that, that means it's not looking good psychologically for our Black children. Um, but what you're seeing here is not only did the effect persist into a subsequent school year, but the mitigation of the racial disparities stuck, such that they remained, it remained more equitable in those outcomes. Um, and so that was quick, and I don't want to take up too much of you all's time. I apologize if it was too quick. I definitely touched on a lot of things, but I really just wanted to make sure that by the time we got to this graph, you understood the, the pieces that make that possible, that it's not some magic bullet. It's not guesswork. It's very, we applied the scientific method and I'm the youngest of three brothers from Memphis, Tennessee. I got kicked out of school seven times. I don't know, we went through seven schools. They got kicked out of more of them than I did. Fortunately, I made it out. They didn't, this is personal for me. I have my little girl. I'm the vice president of the PTA, not because I like planning events, but because I need to make sure my daughter's good and that everyone in the school knows, <laughs> not this one, um, not any of them. But anyway, sorry, I have to run. I will be in touch with John. Um, he knows exactly how to get in touch with me. I'll be happy to come back and talk some more. I'm currently working with some school districts in Southern California. I think I learned it's called High Desert um, and that's where the KKK is. I had no idea. Um, but I, I am down there, and so if I could do something in person, I, I'm happy to. Um, but yeah, thanks for sitting through all of that. Thanks for the work that you all do, and uh, y'all have a great rest of your meeting.